<laughs> wow. Hello. So in 2005, so that's almost eight years ago now, so Integral Institute was maybe two or three years in existence. I was down in El Salvador, and in San Salvador, which is one of the most grimy, you know, black smoke from the buses stain the buildings. There's like vendors littering the streets, and the kids of the street vendors are playing in that black soot. And in the center of the city is an organization. And I was in there, and I was opening a book. Um, on one side of the page, there was something written about um, the organization that I was visiting, and I wanted to show them this, this, this page, and so I showed them the book. On the opposite side of the page, my friend says, ¿Es el trabajo de Ken Wilber? Is that the work of Ken Wilber? And I couldn't believe it. I just, they explained to me that they had, in fact, somewhere found a book by Ken Wilber in their country and had started to apply it already to their work in community development. So fast forward six months, I'm in the Rift Valley of Ethiopia and a friend of a friend who used to work for the UN said, come with me and come check out the work I'm doing with small communities in the, in the cradle of civilization, the Rift Valley on sustainability. And so we walk out like a typical sort of African scene, this, you know, flat land, acacia trees. Under one of those trees gathers about 25 people and they're talking about sustainability and environmental issues in their village. And I look up on the flip chart, and the man is using quadrants in this... <laughs> and he's using it, and he's speaking the local Oromo indigenous language, you know. And so, again, floored. Since then, we've, we've seen the integral approach being used. We've used it ourselves in El Salvador, in the rainforests and villages of, of Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, in the high Andes of Peru, and in the headwaters of the Amazon, also in Peru. And, you know, nevertheless, there's still an optic out there that, you know, that in the integral community is somehow about navel gazing and that it's something about the upper left quadrant only, and there's a sense that it's America American centric. And that's, there is a truth to all of that. But there is another side to the story, and I just really wanted to take a chance to, to share that today. So international development, it's, you know, it's not really that a fascinating a field for many people. They, don't, they may not have heard of it. Who's heard of that as a field of, like a, a professional field? You know, some of, the, some of the hands go up. If I said coaching in this room, everybody's hand would go up. So I figured I had to make this a bit of an enticing topic for you guys to get on board. So, let me appeal to you four reasons why I believe international development is darn sexy. <laughs> One is that it started at world-centric. So in a post-World War II world, the world came together and said, how can this not happen again? And out of that was born the field of international development. That's a pretty good place to start. Number two, it's naturally predisposed to be interdisciplinary. And that counts. Like there's you know, when you, in medicine, for example, you just have to fix my leg. You don't really need an interdisciplinary approach to fix my leg if it's broken, right? But when we're looking at, at complex issues, multiple disciplines are, are definitely needed. S thirdly, there's an orientation to be constantly self-improving. And again, that's not necessarily the case in other fields. But we haven't cracked this nut. There's, there are still hungry people. I loved what you said, Jeff. Um, we've come a long way, but there's a long way to go. So there's this constant... Um, self-improvement. Finally, there's no apparent glass ceiling. When we talk about an integral approach in mainstream development conversations, there's a thirst for this kind of, th these kinds of ideas because they're new and they're, they're appealing. So, this is pretty damn sexy. Nevertheless, in this slide, I wanted to point out that what we see in development is often very varied. So in these three slides, the bottom one here, a, a child dies every, every four seconds. The World Vision advertisements that you often see, the child with crying with flies in their eyes, big belly. At the same time, the top picture is women in a sweatshop factory. That's touted to be um, development, you know, women becoming employed, increasing the economic growth of, of nations. And then finally, the side one is of a community-based process at the village level. All these are development. So to make sense of this, I want to quickly just run us through amber, orange, and green because you can take development as an artifact and, and apply it from any one of those levels. 
So Amber is essentially good, tried and true charity. Usually there's, there's a helper and there's a helpy, and there's usually a power differential between them. So you could probably feel the quality of that. It is anchored in, in the religions, um, which is both its gift and its challenge. I'm just going to fly through these fairly quickly here. Um, the great, uh, one of the greatest gifts is this ability to provide for those most in need, and usually those most forgotten. And this is the gift of, of the charitable Amber approach. The best use I've seen is its ability to respond after natural disasters or humanitarian crises. Fantastic. The drawback, the biggest drawback, is it can and it does create dependency. So people just stop trying, trying them for themselves if they'll wait for handouts. So entire areas running on aid. Doesn't work. It ultimately does not work. So that gives you a bit of a sense of Amber. There's a time when wearing a Band-Aid will no longer give rise to healing. So orange. I've written the word industry up here. Industry in the sense that these guys are the big players. This is a multi-million dollar ball game. The, the structural adjustment programs, the bilateral, bilateral aid programs, the big, the big development projects that you see, the big dams being put in, the big road systems. But at its, at its essence, this is actually the expression of orange, really empowering an entrepreneurial spirit, spirit universally. So letting women as well as men engage in business, for example. Um, this is another aspect of Orange, unleashing and rewarding innovation. So one of these men in this picture, he lives in a very small village in the middle of the, of, of the rainforest in Nigeria, and he saw a better way to go about land use management. And the UN gave him an, an award for his innovation. And mainly just striving for excellence, like honoring that ability to strive for excellence. This is the quality of, of Orange in, in international development. Nevertheless, the drawback, because every one of these stages has a drawback, is that if you seek to invest in economic development completely and fully um, in a way that's disconnected from culture and context and consciousness, then what you get is unsustainability. So this is an example of one of the largest white elephant projects in what we call white elephants in our field in, in Nigeria, where money was just poured into this free trade zone area, big mall, big shopping center, big fair trade zone, which would have been great if it was linked to the current trade policies, if it was connected to something past a pre-modern way of governing. <laughs> um, as a result, the, the place is empty. People don't have the money to go to it anyway. They're living on $2 a day. So this, this sort of... This sort of um, this sort of a limit that Orange reaches is essentially, the way I would put it, is growth without context is unsustainable. So that's where Orange kind of comes to a limit. Sensitivity or green. Green, fascinatingly, green sets the social discourse for the entire field. So the Millennium Development Goals are, inform are informed practically almost all by the green, the green mindset, which is really quite amazing if you think about that. Like, that's, we've come a long way, really. Sensitive to the uniqueness of context. So where Orange was more interested in the universality of, of context, this is more about the uniqueness. So really looking at um, calling for community-based action, keenly aware of cultural differences, very focused on, on history, on place, and on human rights. It's a rights-based approach. And the thing about a rights-based approach is this. For example, let's take gender equality. If you think that is a human right, and I'm not saying it isn't, but if you say it's a human right, then it should already be there. There isn't a pathway to get there. And so you literally have people saying, it's not developmental. Add that onto the inherent green frustration with hierarchy, and what you've essentially done is taken away any evolutionary pathway to get to the change you seek. So where green comes to an end point, in my understanding, is it's stuck, seeking to create change, and yet taking away the very evolutionary pathways toward that change. So enter a more integral space, teal, turquoise. I've written the word coherence here, because that's how it feels to me. It feels like suddenly things come, or, come together in a, in a different way. Before we go into that, I just wanted to say, with great respect 
the earlier expressions of development that still exist today, that we bump into literally on a daily basis in our field, it's only through those partial views that we know our wholeness. So I'm not, I'm not trying to like throw pot shots at amber and orange and green. I'm, just, I'm actually wanting to acknowledge those partialities towards this wholeness. So what I'd like to do is just run through um, five characteristics of this integral space, just give you a feeling of, about what it's like. Um, this is a, a colleague of ours, Vernice Solimar, who also works at JFK University. And the number one characteristic of an integral space is this is a true integration. It's not a pat interdisciplinary thing. It's actually a true integration, a true coherence. And that, you know, that begins, I would say, thinking holes, so it's thinking holistically. And so here she is actually describing in Spanish aqua. And we often, many of us start there. We actually wrote, write the quadrants and we start filling out the quadrants and working through a design process. More and more, um, there's more of a capacity to just immediately see holes and feel holes and then work from there. So this is, this is a bit of a different characteristic. And all of it is integral, but I just wanted to point out that that coherence doesn't seem to end. It gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, number two, seeing development as spontaneous and always already arising. And this is a bit of what Jeff was re referring to as updraft. You know, oftentimes people come in to a country or a place and try and deliver development. Well, for, with an integral view, there's already development happening. There's this in inherent intelligence that's running through manifestation, spirit in action. Development, it's happening. So all, all we're really doing with an integral perspective here is seeing, okay, where, where is it snagged? Where is it folded back on itself? Where is there potential that's not being released or an eddy that it's caught in? And that's mainly what we're doing is just releasing those sticking points for that inherent intelligence to continue. So this is our, one of my colleagues, Lisa Gibson, working in, in West Africa. And then number three, s knowing that self as instrument is your wisest tool. So this is an interesting one. You know, no matter how many degrees you have, no, how much, no, how, no matter how many workshops you go to, how much training you have, there'll be a moment when all you've got is yourself as your instrument to engage. And in this particular slide, this is Michael Simpson. He's one of the, one of the people we work with, the director of One Sky. Um, in West Africa, in Nigeria, where people are very religious, and suddenly the conversation about religion comes up. How do they hold their spirituality? How do they hold their religious beliefs? They're, they're living and working in a very secular world. What to do? And the whole room is like busting at the seams. Ken Wilber has just told us, do not take an amber god head on. Like, just don't do it, you know? And so Mike's like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And he ended up writing on this, on this big board all the perspectives he could think of around religious perspectives, and just worked it through, took the time he needed to work it through, relying not on anything he'd come across or any training he'd had, but on himself as instrument, and uh, moved the space into a really graceful place for everybody. But this is a kind of, this is, this is a kind of razor's edge that we walk, and, and you're, not gonna, you're not gonna necessarily be able to lean on any of the tools you have other than yourself. So this is number four, working on both the relative and the ultimate side of the street. You know, Ramana Maharshi and then later Ken Wilber describes the scenario. What do you do if you come across 4,000 starving people in a dream? And the answer that Ken often gives is, well, you'd feed them dream food because they're hungry, but you also contribute to their awakening. And that's, we, we take that really seriously. It's, it's, a, it's a paradox and none of us necessarily, we ne not necessarily perfected that answer, but at least we can hold the space which includes holding and attending and being with the suffering of the world, but also remembering that there's nothing that's not perfect, radically perfect. So we could spend a whole evening on that, I'm sure, but that's a big one. All of us are practicing in some form, Buddhism, yoga, Christianity. The final one here, before I run out of time, is transcending the us and them um, dynamic that we often find in development into more union. And this one, being the, an integral stage and appreciating fully and deeply that your earlier stages immediately gives a different quality of the space. But beyond that, there's even a more refined way. This is a, a colleague of ours that actually died this summer, but um, James Bay, 
actually finding such a deep heart way to engage with others. And when he was in Nigeria, some of the people that he worked with said it, that they felt like they, he, they'd, they'd actually been sliced open and he'd actually entered into them like that. So they described the quality of union for how he was working with them. And so that's, that's the, f the fifth characteristic of, of an integral um, approach in international development that I'd like to share tonight. So these are all the places where I've personally witnessed an integral approach being used in international development. That's just the beginning. I really, f really feel like that's just the beginning. And I believe as an integral movement, this is profoundly part of our story. I'm not sure how best we can bring it in, but this is, I'm sharing it with you tonight, but it's, it's so, so seriously our story. And all the people that we work with, both in, in our integral teams, as well as the many partner organizations that we connect with across the planet, um, I just feel like there's so much here that we have, we have yet to really, really deeply weave in. So that's, that's that. I just, I just would really ask ourselves, you know, international development, it is sexy, and it's also very ultimately divine. You know, when I, what I'm describing to you is, is something godly, and it, there's great responsibility to that, and there's, there's great, great love. Um, yeah, and I, I just, yeah, I just feel, I feel like as we, f as we contemplate more and more what is next for the integral movement, I just would um, invite us, encourage us to at least take as a minimum the world and then go from there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.